this happen. Okay, I think it's happening. All right, I see okay. your screen. You're seeing the yeah. right one. Okay, awesome. Well, welcome everyone. I'm so excited to be talking to you about this topic about the soul of Agile. Um, you know, I talk a lot about soulfulness. I gave this talk last month, uh, two months ago at Tri Agile in Raleigh. And then another version of it last month in Minneapolis to the org design people. But, you know, I, I tweak it. I tweak it for everybody. But um, so what I'll do is I'm going to start out with a story and then we'll get into, um, you know, what we're going to cover and I'll lay some groundwork about soulfulness in organizations and what that means. And then we'll talk about how we can bring it into our own work. Does that sound like a good plan? Okay. I can't see all of you. Okay, yeah, I can see some of you. Let me see if I can make, see if I can see more of you. Hang on, I like to see everyone. Okay, that's better actually. Okay, ah, better, I can see you all now. Okay, so you might recognize this building, but um, I was at this building in a hot, humid morning in late August, standing in this parking lot, sweating in my Navy grown-up suit that my grandmother helped me buy with her discount at Macy's. Does anyone work in this? Did, has anyone worked in this building? 55 Corporate Drive, Bedminster? AT&T. Oh, I'm giving away. I'm giving away the story. <laughs> so I check out in the back of my car and my little Honda Civic and I see my desk lamp and my stuffed bear Pookie buckled into the car. Remnants from my recent move across the Hudson River from New York to the foreign land of New Jersey, which you're all familiar with, but it was pretty foreign to me. It's my first day at work after graduation. I'm working for this super big, high, successful, high-tech company, but I already gave it away that it's not Google and it's not Tesla. It's 1993 and it's AT&T because they were running those ads. And maybe some of you remember the ads. I wonder if you do um, about the, the glimpse into the future of technology. And it was the, you will, and it was Tom Selleck saying, ever fax from a beach, you will. Or have you ever driven across a country without stopping to ask for directions? You will, right? Of course, we, it's so funny now, because why would you even fax from a beach? But I was like, faxing from the beach? I can't even imagine. That's amazing. And, you know, the guys there with the tablet on the ad. So I went to go work there. So my own future is calling, not just the future of technology. So I leave Pookie the bear in the car and walk into this green glass building. My new, my new boss greets me there and introduces me to my assigned mentor. So they set me up in this, oh, they set me up in this room watching these mind numbing onboarding videos. And I'm sitting there for a couple of hours and my mentor finally comes in mercifully and says, oh, there's gonna be a big meeting after lunch, mandatory in the big conference room. And I was like, a meeting? My first meeting? I was so excited. I was like, we're gonna talk about faxing from the beach, yay. But I go into the, so I go into the meeting and here it is. And I see this and this like was packed. There's people sitting, literally sitting on the floor, which I couldn't because my skirt was way too tight. So they let me sit in one of the chairs and this guy walks up to the front and I see him and I know him from the onboarding videos. Cause he's like the big cheese guy. And he comes in and he walks up to the front and he holds the microphone, taps it, <clears throat> coughs into it. And then says, there's going to be a reduction in force. This is my literal first day. I'm not even exaggerating in this story. Um, and I was like, I don't even know what a reduction in force is. So I look at my mentor looking puzzled and he's like, it's layoffs. And I was like, layoffs? I just moved across the river with my stuff down on my lamp. Like, well, I just moved here. We're having layoffs. And he looks at me and he says, don't worry about it. You don't get paid enough to get laid off. They won't lay you off. And he was right about both of those things, right? They didn't lay me off and they did not pay me enough. But what I noticed was over the next few months, only thing anyone ever talked about was speculation about who's going to get laid off and what the package was going to look like and where they were going to work next and how much of a pension they had. And nobody was talking about vaxing from the beach. Nobody was talking about really any work at all. <laughs> so I was just kind of like new person, just graduated college, hanging out there, but nothing was really happening. So that was my first introduction to having my soul crushed at work but it happened multiple times that was not the last time my soul would be crushed at work it happened again when i was asked to rank my team members against each other you know like calibration session it happened again when i had an idea that was shut down right before i could even get the words out of my mouth 
It happened when I was required to work on a project that I knew was bad for the business. And again, when I witnessed unethical decisions being made and then my objections were ridiculed. Um, and it was just plain hard to get work done every day. And I'm sure that you all can agree with the fact that it's soul crushing, a soul crushing environment is not good for business. But let's talk about this because I'm sure whenever I give these talks, you've all had a soul crushing moment too. So I'm going to give you a chance to share your soul crushing moment because I find that if I don't do this, then you're thinking about your soul crushing moment the whole time. So I have a Slido here. Um, oh, let's see. How do I get the, is it, oh, here we go. There you go. There's the code. So if you would like to go ahead and share your soul crushing moment, we would love to hear it. And then we are going to help each other release our soul crushing moment from the baggage that we carry around with us. And I'm sure you've had many, but maybe we can like limit ourselves to one or two. first time I laid someone off. So not just being laid off, but laying other people off can be soul crushing. Yeah. I had to tell the team that the system they created was not going to be used. Yeah. Shelved, right? That's the worst feeling. You put your heart and soul into it, your soul into it, and then it's never used. Laid off after two months due to company not getting funding. Oh yeah. And you change every, you, you know, move across the river <laughs> or whatever you had to do to move into that work. Soul crushing. Let's see what else? I see there's three people still typing. So let's see what we have. When my company management quiet fired me without actually firing me and allowing me to continue getting my paycheck, but stepping me off my responsibilities. Oh, yeah. That's like uh, office space where he's in the basement, right? He still kind of works there, but not really. Having three bosses in the first three months on the job. Okay, this is, see, I'm not the only one who had a soul-crushing moment on their very first day out of college ever. Okay, being told to allocate engineers to 125% as normal as a manager and being expected to work every weekend. Oh, yeah, no capacity management. All right, I know there's still a few typing. Let's see. Watching my business group whittle down from three teams to one in the last year. Laid off because the CTO had a personal grudge. All right, I'm just going to take the two more and then we're going to let it all go. And you can still type them in. I had five bosses in the last six months. Wow, it seems like a boss a month seems to be the trend here. Before being laid off, no one met with me. Oh, yeah, that's really soul crushing and soul sucking, isn't it? All right. I know there's one being typed and then I'm going to let us, we're going to release all of this. Being promised I could take time off during my daughter's visitation week and then being required to fly across the country. Yeah. Soul crushing. So now we're going to take all those soul crushing moments and the burden that we feel with carrying them around with us and what that takes, you know, the, the, the behaviors that those create, right? They're not good for business. We carry them. I mean, I carried this one since I graduated college, which is not yesterday, right? <laughs> But through my whole life, it's affected me. So let's go ahead and just let all of those go. Just let those go, the soul crushing moments. Okay, so now that we let all those go, we can move forward and talk about how to create soulful organizations and soulful agility. So that soul crushing, trying to figure out where to put your faces here. Um, put you over here. The soul crushing we just sloughed off is the one that gets in the way of a thriving business. It gets in the way of our own happiness, and it also gets in the way of a thriving business. So that's why we talk about businesses thriving when they use a soulful lens. So I know Fernando already introduced me, but I wasn't sure. So I put this slide here, mother of three teenagers. Come on, that, that gives me all the credibility in the world. Um, I am a consultant, author, speaker, entrepreneur. I'm creating some online content around the book right now. Um, and then 
agility. I'm also, I should mention on the org design forum board, because I know you mentioned th things about org design. So I would love to make sure that this group has an invite for next year's conference. We just had it last month in Minneapolis, but we'll have it next year somewhere. I don't know where yet, but it's a great conference of, it's like a hundred, we had a record number of 130 this year. So it's pretty intimate and people like people who are the real deal. Anyway, so I love org design too. And I love connecting the soulful and the practical, which I'm going to talk about with you in a minute. All right, so that's me. So how are we going to spend this time together? Well, I'm going to lay some groundwork for you on what I mean by soulful organization. Like, what is it? <laughs> so some, yeah, go ahead. I think we may be a slide behind you. I'm seeing that I'm oh, judging the slide. Okay, sorry about that. Yep, there you go. Well, now you know what I, you already know what I look like. <laughs> Oh, here we go. Thank you. Cause I, cause I have this whole thing here and your faces are here. So <laughs> thank you, Daniel. So our time together today, what's a soulful organization. And so it's a lot of groundwork and concepts. I'll, and it'll be interactive, but there's some groundwork. Um, and then we'll get into like, what does it mean for us as agilists? Like what, where do we play in this space of soulful organizations? Sound like a good plan. Okay. So when you saw that, I mean, you all came, right? But you saw that the title was, we're talking about the soul of Agile, or I forget, is that what we called it, Fernando? The soul of Agile or soulful organization. I change the title sometimes. Um, how many of you thought that I was going to be burning incense and have wearing a, looking all hippie and <laughs> doing that kind of thing? Some of you maybe a little bit, but you came anyway. Um, but that is not me. Nothing not wrong with that, if that's you, but that's not me. I really do believe that attending to soul at work is very, very practical matter. And that's why I talk about connecting the soulful and the practical. I don't, you know, it is how we businesses thrive. It is how we live as human beings. And it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be woo woo. It can be very practical. So if you're still wondering what I mean by soulful, um, you know, we've already talked about soul crushing and everybody understands soul crushing viscerally. But let's talk about soulful, because sometimes that's confusing. People don't know what I mean. Um, it is bringing the essence of who you are to work that has meaning with people you feel connected with, right? It is like that. It's more than bringing your whole self to work. It's like that inside. Um, and I would also note, I don't use the word joy or happy intentionally, because those are just two emotions. And I, to me, soulfulness is all the range of emotions. We're not it's not forced happiness, right? We're not happy every day. I'm not going to force people to be happy when they're not. That doesn't go well. But it's just about being, you know, feeling how we feel or being who we are. So that's why I choose the word soul. And yes, I went around and around on finding the exact right word. So this is the one. This is where we ended up. And people seem to know what it means. Questions on the definition at all? Okay. I, I think it's interesting that your relatedness and purpose tie right into self-determination theory and Daniel Pink's book on uh, uh, Drive. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about Daniel Pink in just a minute. So I want to hear more about how, what do you think ties in? Which part? Well, you talk about work, people who you feel connected with, that's mm -hmm. relatedness. Yeah. And um, work that has meaning for you is purpose. Yes. So those are two like fundamental concepts in psychological theory of like motivation. And it, it I just, I, I like how that ties in with what you're talking about. Thank you. Good. Yes. Those things are important. And we're going to get to some more things that are even more lower on the hierarchy and important too. Um, but let's just talk about so, soulful and practical. So all my work, whether it's soulful work or not, um, and the subtitle of my book is connecting the soulful and the practical, because again, I feel like there are consultants, people, whatever consultants, let's just say out there that are about the soulful part, team building, you know, like connection and all that. And then there's like the other people that are getting business results and they're like separate. And I really don't think these two things are separate. I think these two things need to interact together. Like when we're having soulful connections, it should be while we're doing a quarterly business review. Like there's no reason that we go have pizza and then have a quarterly business review later. Like let's have the pizza at the quarterly business review. Let's have fun there. Why doesn't my quarterly business review? I played music, right? <laughs> because there's no reason not to. It doesn't have to be, we can play improv games, right? These two things don't have to be separate. So every practical element has a soulful purpose. 
We'll talk about that in a minute. So even the boring stuff, right? Even budget planning. And that every soulful element needs a practical implementation. It can't just be preachy. So these two things need to be connected all the time. Does that make sense to you all? That this is the core of all the work that I do, any work that I do is connecting these two things. Now, let's do, talk about some content, concepts here. The three conditions for soulful organizations, and this is where I'm gonna talk about Dan Pink when we get to the end here, Daniel. Um, so I think that there are three basic conditions, like core conditions that have to exist in order for a soulful organization to even sprout or be, you know, thrive. First one, well, let me ask you before I even tell you, how does it feel when someone has power over you? Like, and they can flick you like a bug like that. How does that feel for you? You can just share. It feels, how does it feel? Uncomfortable. Uncomfortable. Yeah, as humans, humans, we don't like that feeling. We know, I mean, I, I particularly don't like it. I never liked it when I was a kid and there was grownups around, but, and I didn't like it when I went into work and had bosses. Like it just doesn't feel good when someone has power over you, but it's not just power. It's that the reason that that doesn't feel good is not just because of the power. It's that loss of dignity. Like, so when I think about some things like, um, well, we'll talk about Dan Pink in a minute, but it's like, I can't have autonomy, mastery, and purpose and those higher level things until I have basic dignity met. And some places do. Look, if you work at Patagonia or something, that's wonderful. You probably have dignity. But most of the workplaces that I've been in are lacking basic human dignity. You know, ranking people against each other deprives people of their dignity. Um, a lot of the reward systems that we have are designed to make you hustle for your self-worth, which is robbing you of dignity. And the things that you all put in there of your soul crushing moment were robbing people robbed of dignity. So I don't, you know, we can talk about purpose and autonomy and that's great if you've risen up, if, if you have dignity, right? But if you don't, that's some of the basics that we need to put in place. Feeling of worthiness. The second um, condition for soulfulness is creativity. And when I say this, I know people like, well, I'm not a writer or a painter or an artist, but I don't mean that kind of creativity. Uh, Rick Rubin just wrote a great book about creativity. And he says, it's bringing something into existence that wasn't there before. It doesn't have to be music or art. It can be a PowerPoint. It can be a meeting. It can be, you know, a document. It's something boring, but it's, we've created something. Um, and then Doug Kirk, Kirk, Kirkpatrick from uh, Corporate Rebels, if you don't read their newsletters, you should. Um, is the desire to create is one of the deepest human needs on a psych psychological par with the physical needs of food and shelter. So there you go. It's a hierarchy of needs. And, you know, there are places where you can be creative it, that just like simply adding a little bit of creativity to the work you're already doing. You, you don't have to change everything, right? Like I talked about, I played music in my quarterly business review, right? That was not a whole lot of effort, but it made it a bit more memorable and, and lively than everybody else's cross-pollinating ideas is another thing that you know can create can spark some creativity and we just had an article today for the org design forum about how hard it is with remote work to spark creativity because you're not bumping into people but that's just something to think about okay so number two is creativity Oh, so this is just, we're not going to do a Slido, but <clears throat> just a quick poll. How does it feel for you when you're being creative? Like maybe you could just shout it out. Like, how does it feel in, in your body or how do you, how do you feel physically when you're being creative? Energized and excited. Thank you, Daniel. Those are my, that's exactly how it makes me feel. <laughs> Anybody else? I'm ready. Happy. It's the best time of the day, you know, when you have those opportunities. Yeah. Anybody else want to share? I would say exceedingly comfortable. You know, it's a sweet spot to be in. Great. Thank you. Exceedingly comfortable. Yeah, I mean, time flies, right? You're in a flow state. And the problem is that we don't spend enough time at work. And I've got all these statistics that I didn't include here about how much time people spend actually being creative at work. You know, it's, it's a pleasure if you get a moment to, people always say, I need a moment to think, but I think they need a moment to be creative. 
Okay. So creativity is number two, and we all know it feels good. And it's also good for business. Of course, it's good for business, right? Because we're creating things. Um, and then the third one is connection. So we talked about connection right in the beginning. That was your comment, Daniel. Um, work is a human system and human systems are fueled by connection. So that is the fuel that feeds the system that's working, that's making the work happen and thrive. So we can't really live without connection. Um, and I always say, you know, people used to get their connection in their village that they lived in, right? Maybe you owned a, you were a cobbler or something and you're, you, or you own the market, but, um, now we, our village is, we spend our time outside the village. So work is really the new village and we need to get our human connection eight hours, if you're lucky, eight hours a day, maybe more, but you're spending eight hours a day with these people, right? Like that you need to get, you can't wait till you get home for human connection. <laughs> you need to get it well, where you're spending the bulk of your time. So from a soulful perspective, it feeds our souls. From a practical perspective, it helps business thrive, right? There's really no downside. Okay, so the three conditions for soulful organizations, dignity, creativity, and connection. And Daniel, I was just making the, you know, I, I thought a lot about Dan Pink's autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And I just thought, yeah, once you get these three, you can get those three, <laughs> right? But you need these three first. Any questions on the three conditions or comments? Right. So your point uh, about how does it feel having someone above you, like having power over you, it mm. made me thinking that uh, maybe some people are different. I'm being an entrepreneur. I definitely like to be uh, responsible to myself ultimately. And with every client I st and also um, employ, I typically establish a partnership type of relationship where everyone is equal we just everyone ha plays their own role in this creating something together but I know that uh, not everyone is like this uh, mm -hmm. and being someone's employee and reporting to someone is an important motivational factor for many people not everyone is in internally motivated right nothing wrong with that what do you mm -hmm. think so I wrote about this in this white paper. I have it here. Let me see if I can grab it off the shelf. Uh, is this it? No, that's somebody else's white paper. Okay. Uh, anyway, I wrote this white paper called um, Structural Agility. Here it is. I'm going to show you. You can download it on my website. Structural Agility. And in there, I talk about... Um, the. So there's a difference between hierarchy. I'm not against hierarchy. There's a difference between hierarchy and power over. So hierarchy is fine. There's nothing, we really can't organize without a hierarchy. It's silly to think that. I know holacracy, people think you can, but then they have circles that are in hierarchies. So <laughs> um, I, there's nothing wrong with hierarchy. It's the power over. So the it's like that you your boss is in control of your full fate, right? Like that's the part where, you know, you can you can manage that. Of course, they're, they are going to be directing work. So there's nothing wrong with that. It's that like they're in control of my entire fate is the problem. So there's okay. ways you can manage that with different kinds of performance systems and things. But yeah, that's the part. That's the flick you like a bug thing. That's not, that doesn't feel good. But you can still have a boss. I can't, you can't, but other people can. <laughs> okay. All right. Any other questions or comments before we keep going? Okay, so I want to talk for a minute, a couple of minutes, just about soulful language, because language is so important, and it has such a big impact on the soulfulness of our organizations. Um, you know, it it sets that scaffolding about how you how we think and how we feel. And if you speak different, if anyone speaks a foreign language or speaks another language here, then you know that the mindset and the worldview in the different language cultures is different. And I got this quote from Braiding Sweetgrass, where she talks about on, um, only third English is a noun based system. And that's why it's a culture obsessed with things where her native language was more verb based. And it was more about the doing and the connecting, not as much about not as object centric. So that's just one way, but I know there's a, there's a whole study of linguistics about all the ways that it changes us. So I think about the language in organizations, in corporate culture, 
and how that's shaping how we think and feel, right? So I know there's a lot of examples of this before we get to the examples. Um, let's just, I just want to say this one thing. We need to bridge the language from corporate, the cor current corporate culture language to a more soulful language. So, you know, you might not want to go into work tomorrow and start talking all kind of soulful hippie language that we're talking about here, right? But you can bridge it to what's in place already. Um, employee engagement might be a thing to talk about to get to, you know, creating connection and things like that. So you can bridge with some of the words that are there and start to shift the language slowly. I don't, you know, but then I give these talks and then people always call me up the next day and say, we just, I just started using soulful and everyone loves it. So you never know. But I think people are getting a little more tolerant of this kind of language in companies, but definitely bridge with what's there so that people can understand um, what it means. Okay. So one of the types of, one of the sort of sets of language that I love is living systems language. And only because it's so, it's so resonant to how people feel when you start talking about living systems and using living systems metaphors, people just, people understand it immediately. So traditionally corporations, what is it? It's like sports metaphors and war language, right? Like that's what we always use. But if you use living systems language, it feels better. So close your eyes or don't, but if you're comfortable, close your eyes. And I'm going to think, just feel how it feels when I say this first sentence, and then I'll do a second one. So this first sentence is, I want this team to flourish and thrive. So how does that feel when I, well, okay, just hold on for the second one. Just notice how you feel when I say, I want this team to flourish and thrive. And now here's the second one. I want this team to succeed, achieve, and win. I used a different tone of voice, I know, but I, want, I won't even use a tone of voice. I want this team to succeed, achieve, and win. All right. Anyone notice, you can open your eyes, how, what, what felt different in the first one versus the second one? Natalie? First one is more connected. The second one is more official or formal. Yeah, it was formal. Yeah. Okay, Natalie, how about you? So to me, the first one was colorful and having flesh, like flesh. Yeah. <laughs> but the second one was like a skeleton. The bones are there, the structure is there, but it, it, it does not appeal to me in that, that kind of language. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else? Daniel? Um, I agree with what, what uh, was said about, uh, I, feel, I felt more connected with the first one. The second one, my response was, yeah, 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 I've heard this before. You don't really mean anything by it. It was <laughs> completely inauthentic. Mm, okay. Dean, did you have a response? Well, the second one to me was, you know, sounded dry. Dry, yeah, so. Agreed. Yeah. Well, I think to me, too, the um, the way I feel when I hear myself say it, I guess, is, you know, when I talk about flourish and thrive, I feel like, oh, there's so many possibilities here. And when you say succeed and achieve, I'm like, okay, shut down all possibilities, because we need to like completely fo focus and like stop being distracted. Like there's no, there's no open to any kind of creativity or innovation because we need to like buckle down. That's how I feel. Not everyone's Just like. putting more money into stake, into shareholders pockets. That's <laughs> <laughs> how it translates. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> Make some more money for those shareholders. Right. Mm. So that's like some of the examples with the living systems language. And here's where I show you know, I use this slide a lot for living systems. We're growing this tree. We, you know, we're kind of planting the seeds. We don't know it's going to adapt and uh, and move and grow itself versus building this factory that is going to do maybe what we expect it to do, but in this box, right? So when you use these factory metaphors, war metaphors, um, sports metaphors, it's like it's within the confines of what that thing is. Well, maybe war is not, but we don't want that. <laughs> I had, oh my gosh, this is going to be recorded. Maybe I shouldn't say it. I had this client who was like, we built one Death Star. Now we just need to go build more Death Stars. And I was like, I'm, no. <laughs> First of all, they blew that up at the end of the movie. And second of all, no bad guys. <laughs> We're not going to build that. <laughs> Star Wars fan though. 
anyway, speaking of Star Wars, uh, what soulful, let's, so let me turn this over to you, um, of what soulful words you can use to replace soulless words and phrases. So moving from the stormtrooper to Yoda. It's perfect. I talked about the Death Star, see? Um, I'm going to let you do it. I'm, I, you know, I didn't know how many of you there were going to be. There's not that many, but we can maybe go ahead and put it in Slido anyway, just for fun. Oh, so any soul soulful words that we can use to replace soulless, but I know all I know all agile people are going to say resources. So anything except resources, that one's off limits because <laughs> agile people are like, don't say resources. <laughs> Humans, well, we can say humans instead of resources. One of the reasons I ask this question is to get ideas. But I'll share with you ideas that I have. Create instead of implement. Yeah, right? Coherence over alignment. Yeah, that's such a that's such a uh, living systems word too, coherence. Okay. Oh, we got one more coming in. And I'll show you my list. We'll see. But I'm very fascinated with the use of language in corporations because I do think that that is one of the soul crushing. And we tr they try and sanitize it so much that it's not even vibrant anymore. Connect instead of network. Okay, I like that. Safe to speak your truth rather than psychological safety. Oh, interesting. So psychological safety is not uh, such a feel good word, huh? Does anyone want to speak about that? Yeah. No, Matt. I didn't put that up, but I've been with other people, other sessions, and I know there's a bit of blowback about that word. Oh. You know, whether it is really true, or really something you could equally cultivate, or maybe some people feel like some um, very in the context of the company, you know, it depends. So you can't always say psychological safety is determinant of X, Y, Z. It might depend on the group or the company or the team. But sure. again, um, other opinions. Interesting. Can I see you have your hand up? Yeah, I was going to put that in there. Like the word psychological kind of throws it off a little bit for me as an example, right? Psychological safety. There's also the whole misinterpretation of what it means, you know yeah. what I mean, if that's out there. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I feel like safe to speak your truth is more personal. Mm -hmm. You know, it's more direct, it's more, um, it's clearer. So, yeah yep. yeah i i because of the oh what is his name tim something i can't even remember now who wrote the book one of the books but one of the early books on psychological safety he makes a distinction between social safety and intellectual safety so i usually use the word social safety like we're not going to kick you out of the group because of what you say unless it's totally offensive um but intellectual safety you will not have because we are going to challenge each other <laughs> we are not we're not giving intellectual safety uh, yep, making those distinctions. Yep. Yeah. All right. So let's take a look at some of the words that I had on my list here, which we uh, have covered. Uh, be before, oh, okay. maybe there is a comment in the chat by John, right? Who doesn't have a possibility to talk too much because he's on the train. Maybe I can read his comment. I okay. I can't get to it for some reason. To the topic of psychological safety, he says psychological safety is fine slash great when it's genuine, but definitely straddles the line of corporate jargon at this point. It's like with everyone, every nice word in the beginning can become bureaucratic with time, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you, John. Um, yeah, I can see the chat now. Sorry, I didn't realize it only pops up when I roll over it. Okay, cool. Um, so some other words to think about. So instead of using machine or factory, we can talk about ecosystems or biomes or something. I, I would love a better word there because I really need one. But resources and people we talked about or humans, um, you know, we talk about eliminate a lot or something where we can talk about shedding. I love the word shedding. I That's my favorite word, but or releasing even um, because really it's not always bad. 
it's not always bad to eliminate things. Like sometimes it's like a shedding. Uh, success, achieve, win, like I said in my example, can be replaced with thrive, flourish, vibrant. I love the word vibrant. Um, launch can be, you know, bring to life. And one of you put something like that in the chat. Create instead of implement. Um, plan and execute can be replaced. Plan and execute. I mean, come on. If plant, so nurture, reap, like there's so many wonderful words out there that are better than execute. <laughs> Create was one that you all put there. So thank you for that. Okay. So something to think about is like, what words are, feel soul crushing and what can we replace them with? So now I'm going to jump away from language. And I just want to walk you through the constructs of three pieces, which is the soulful leader, the soulful team, and the soulful organization, because I think that these three things can be approached differently. In my book on transformational leadership, I talk about the me, the we, and the system. So sort of when I think about soulfulness, it sort of translates directly to soulful leader, soulful team, soulful organization. <clears throat> so let's talk about those three. Oh, see it maps. There you go. There's the mapping. So the soulful leader. Um, so there's quite a few things that we, when we do, we have a soulful assessment that we use. Um that there's a quite a few competencies and characteristics under a soulful under each of these things, but I'm just going to share one of them with you for tonight. Um, but one of the biggest like overarching things is soulful leaders don't pollute. So I don't know who remembers this ad from the seventies, but that was what, okay. I have one nod at least. Woodsy the owl says, don't give a, give a hoot. Don't pollute. Like don't pollute. This is, and so understanding how as a leader, how you're polluting the folks around you, and their ability to th create a thriving business. Not, it's not about feel good only, it's that too, but it's also about like to be productive and get work done and be creative. When your presence is causing pollution, that's something you need to be looking at, right? So um, did you ever, oh, before I go to that slide, do you ever like sit in a meeting and you're, somebody walks in and like all of a sudden it gets tense? And it's like, oh, that person, yeah, right? It's like, oh, that person like changed the changed the uh, atmosphere. Did you ever think that person was you? Well, I found out that it was me. So I was working in a tech startup, you know, during the dot-com boom. And my official title, I think, was chief product officer or something. But my unofficial title was like queen of GSD. Do you know GSD? Get shit done. Getting shit done. That was my job. But I didn't really realize how I was showing up until I came in one day and I overheard two people talking and they didn't see me there. And they were like, one says to the other, you hear that sound? When you hear that sound, the high heels on the marble floor or the elevator dings and then you hear the high heels step off the elevator, then that means Jardine is here and that we have to turn down the music and get serious. And I was like, what, me? I, I was young and fun, but I wasn't that fun. It wasn't that fun because I shut down everyone's fun. As soon as I got off the elevator, they knew to shut the music off and stop having fun and act serious. And it wasn't really good for their, it wasn't good for them. They stopped having fun and it wasn't good for business because all creativity got shut down and productivity got, you know, stifled. So, but I was young and I was ambitious and I wanted to get shit done. And I wanted to show that I was, should be taken seriously, even though I was young and female and that ego got in the way of me and it got in the way of everyone and it got in the way of business getting done, to be honest. So that's polluting. <laughs> that's me polluting. And I mean, I'm sure we've all done it, right? Like we've all polluted, but just being aware of the impact you have when you walk into a room, I think if leaders could just do one soulful thing, that would be the thing. So the way I think about it, soulful leaders are responsible really for three things, right? To cultivate the conditions for soulfulness, to open up new possibilities that weren't there before, like help the team see that some new things are possible. And then, you know, we still have to get, you're still running the business, right? We're still setting direction and ensuring business results. Sometimes I hear people talk about soulful things, you know, there's different words for it, but in leadership and they forget about the, like, we still have to have a business that's making money. So that number three is still important, even when we're soulful. Any questions on the soulful leader, uh, three outcomes that they're responsible for? Okay. Cause I'm going to give you another list really quick. 
Um, so soulful leader capabilities, like I said, we have an assessment that we look at to like, see if we can assess the levels of soulfulness across leaders, self-awareness. That's kind of what we just talked about. Emotional intelligence is key. The not having a big ego is really important. Curiosity is key. And then again, still setting direction, <laughs> still have to set direction. I see some leaders that are like these coachy leaders and they don't want to set any direction and no one knows what to do. Right. So we still set direction. But really, the thing that makes a soulful leader a soulful leader is that the people feel like they're a soulful leader, right? Like we can, we've done assessments, we can do any assessment we want, but ultimately it's that the people feel like their spirit and growth has been elevated. I mean, that's at the bottom, that's like, that is the North Star question. We, you know, you can measure these things that might create conditions, but it's how they make other people feel. So when I think about soulful leadership, then the question is how to, okay, so now we're going to get to the Agilist part of the program, or I'm going to start to pepper it in. So how do Agilists support soulful leadership? Well, modeling it is always a good idea. But then I talk about also, you know, we, we all work with leaders, some of us more than others, but, you know, we have contact with leaders. So it's helping to uncover that soulful leadership. And I say uncover because I am making an assumption that it's there. <laughs> it's just been right? It, they've just created armor and fear over time, or maybe they've mislearned things, but feedback conversations, and then using some of the agile practices for support. Like the tra transparency is a great one to help soulful leaders kind of see what's happening or maybe non-soulful leaders see what's happening. Okay. Any comments, questions? Awesome. Yeah, one comment. I keep thinking about, uh, I like your phrase, I'm assuming it's there. It just needs to be uncovered. That's a great assumption. Uh, whether it's true or not is a big philosophical question, isn't it? So we can say, we hope it can get uncovered. If not in this generation, maybe in the next generation. Well, it might be really hard or impossible to uncover. Right. But this is the, do we believe all people are good or not? Right. There's something good in all people, whether or not it's accessible. Good, good. Yeah. <laughs> Different but, question. But uh, let's say you have uh, 20 tools, 20 talents in your toolbox. That's how you were born and raised. Right. This is why you have those 20 tools in your toolbox. And you are saying to someone, hey, it's easy. Just pick up this screwdriver and use it. And maybe that poor guy, he just doesn't have a screwdriver in his toolbox. So that's, uh, isn't it a deep philosophical question? Yes, it is. <laughs> mm -hmm. But all we can do is work from where we are. Some managers are simply not interested, says Ken. And also, oh, misinterpret. Oh, what's misinterpreted? Oh, okay. Are we talking about the psychological safety? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, you know, we have to, all we can do is work with positive intent with what right, we have. Right, yeah, I agree. And that goes with the positive intent. We're not going to talk about positive intent today, but we do talk about that, which is, you know, we can assume that there is a soulful leader that can be uncovered or sorry, inside, but if it can't be uncovered, then not having the person in that job is okay, right? <laughs> like you, you can try as, you can assume positive intent, but- mm -hmm. You know, if the person if the person's not the right match, they're not the right match. You can't mm -hmm. <laughs> keep trying. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right. So the last thing I'll say about soulful leaders is how you show up matters. So just being paying attention to how you show up. And that's sort of the don't pollute thing. Um, okay, so let's talk about soulful team. <clears throat> so I love talking about soulful teams with agile groups because this is where the rubber meets the road. Like Soulful teams are the embodiment of a soulful organization. That's, you know, you have the leaders who are kind of setting the pace and tone maybe, and then we'll get to the organization, which is the mechanics of the system, but where the soulfulness happens is on the team. <laughs> so the work that agilists do is so key. It's like right in the heart of the soul, the heart of the soul. It's right in the soul of the soul, I guess. But so, you know, that's, that's where it's so, it's so key. So. Again, there's a lot of things to talk about in terms of soulful teams, but the one that I think is, you know, key that I would share with you all is pain blocks teams, right? If there is pain, the team cannot flourish. So we need to attend to the pain. And I'm sure a lot of you do this in your work anyway, 
But, you know, I look at transformations and it's like, we're going to layer on this framework and we're going to do all this stuff. And it's like, yeah, everyone's like working over capacity. They're traumatized from all the layoffs. And until you address that and attend to it, n- none of these fancy frameworks are going to make any difference, <laughs> right? Even unless I'm selling it, but that's what I always joke. But um, no, really, like we really do need to attend to that pain. So we had, um, yeah. We, I was uh, consulting once at a client and they put us in a room to do some interviews like they do with consultants, if you've ever done that. And um, kind of like the movie Office Space again. And people just were like nervous when they came in. I was just like, we just want to talk about opportunities for improvement. And people were like super nervous because what I found out later from somebody was, I don't know, six weeks before that, they had a consultant in there that gave interviews and then everyone got, then a bunch of people got laid off. So I was like, well, okay, see, that's leftover pain that's now coming into us trying to make some improvements that have, I hopefully we weren't laying people off. That's not what I was there for. So anyway, attending to the pain is really important. And I think that the thing about pain is just being willing to stand squarely in the pain, even if you don't know how to solve it and direct, you know, think about energy, directing energy towards healing it. Whenever I see organizations in pain and I raise it, all I'll hear is like, yeah, well, that's always been a problem. That's just a problem. It's like, no, no, that's ignoring the, uh, we, there's nothing we can do about it. Right. Well, that's not attending to it. So it needs to be faced. I think there's a quote somewhere. I don't have it in here about no, nothing can be solved until it is faced or something. I don't know. James Baldwin. Anyway, it's a good quote, but that's the key there is just knowing to being willing to hear it. And, you know, I talk about that too. You, I don't know. Are you, is anyone familiar with this phrase that uh, helped, hugged, or heard? Yes. It's a good one, right? Do you want to say I what it is? It. You want to say mm-hmm. what it is? I've been using it a lot. Well, if someone is in a state they're unhappy, say, we, everybody has a preference for how they re- we respond because some people will want to fix the problem. And a person might not want that. And, and the helped, hugged, or heard is, do you want someone to, do you want me to help? Like Jardina, if you come to me and say, I'm really unhappy about this, I could either help you by giving you an idea to, to help you solve it, just listen to you, or just give you a hug and show so much compassion. And it gives the per, it gives you that agency about what you want from other people. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah. I had this happen just the other day where I had a problem and a friend was like starting to give me some advice. And I was like, Hugged, please. Hugged. <laughs> but with pain, a lot of times it, you know, leaders are like, well, I can't do anything about it. So I don't want to hear it. And it's like, no, it's just heard. They just want to be heard. You don't have to, it does, they don't have to be helped. You know, sometimes heard is enough. So just something to take into consideration because I think that organizations tend to avoid dealing with things that they don't have an answer for. Okay. Soulful team capabilities heal their pain, heal their own pain. So, right. So we, as agilists will often help them heal their pain, but like eventually what a soulful team does is heal its own and resolve its own conflicts. As you know, as agilists focus, focus. Oh my gosh. Is there nothing more soul crushing than not being able to focus? Right. You know, we talked about creativity. It feels good when we can focus. It feels terrible when we're scattered all over the place. Um, and then, oh, here, look, I have it right here, Ken. Uh, so connection is the social safety and challenge is the intellectual safety. So we still want to be able to challenge each other and feel intellectually stimulated without feeling like we're going to be kicked out of the group because they don't like our idea. Um, but again, just like we said about soulful leaders, soulful teams elevate each other's spirit and growth. So ultimately, whether you have the capabilities or not, if you feel like your spirit and growth are elevated by this group, group it's a soulful group. Maybe that's how you feel about Agile Princeton. Okay. So how do Agile support soulful teams? These are just some ideas. There's lots of ways. We'll talk about it in a few minutes. But, you know, attending to the team soul. Oh, here it is. Solving the problem that needs to be solved, not just the one you know how to solve. Right? That's one of the quotes. Um, Helping the team use Agile practices in a soulful way. Um, you know, we'll talk in a minute about daily standups, but you can really use them in a very soul crushing way. Uh, Jira can be used in a soul crushing way. Any of these tools can be used either soulfully or soul crushingly. Um, and then, you know, (laughs) 
do I need to say individuals and interactions over processes and tools? I mean, that is, that is the whole soulful part of the manifesto, right? I don't, I don't need to say it, but I put it in there anyway. All right. I'm going to jump to soulful organization. And then we're going to talk about like how we can, what we're going to do with this as agilists. This is my last piece before we get to agile stuff. Uh, so soulful organization is like the system, right? It's the, it, but what we need to do for a soulful organization is operationalize that soulfulness into the processes and policy, right? So it's embedded in there. It's woven in, it's in the DNA. Um, w. Edwards Deming says my favorite, one of my favorite quotes here, a bad system can beat a good person every time. But I also wonder if the inverse or converse, if the converse is also true, if a good system can encourage a bad person to be good, right? Like, can we change, can we flip that? Can our system be so strong? And I've seen this people who are like terrible at some company go to a better company and they're like, so happy and lovely and open right? Because they were working in a bad system. So when I talk about soulful systems, it's the question is, how do we shape the system for soulfulness? And the answer is not another methodology. It's never another methodology, right? We have enough methodologies and frameworks out there. I am going to give you a little bit of a framework now, but it's, it is really about looking at what's making things soul crushing and unpacking some of that. It's not about getting McKinsey to come in and give you a framework. Okay. <laughs> Just never that. Uh, let me see. There's something in the chat here. Oh, John needs to drop. Okay. Bye, John. Okay. Now that I know how to see the chat. So it's not another methodology, but what is it? So I have a little framework here. It's not really a methodology, but there's three steps I like to think about when I'm looking at this, the organizational system of what is you know, how do we turn, how do we create more soulfulness in the system? And I just asked three questions. First, what is it that's making it soul crushing? So if I'm looking at any of the processes, like let's say we look at um, budget planning, performance management, like some of the typical soul crushing things that are just kind of universally soul crushing. But then you might even think about, dare I say, uh, your daily standup. Like, is your daily standup soul crushing? Some are. Right. What about planning? Is that soul crushing for people? Um, I was in a completely soul crushing um, review session, but you know, that that's supposed to be a feel good. What happened? So the question is what makes it soul crushing? So maybe in your um, budget planning, it's because we're all pitted against our peers, right? That's one of the things that make it soul crushing or that they always cut our budget that, you know, we can't, we have to do more with less. So that makes it soul crushing. The second question then is, if that's what makes it soul crushing, what, what was the original soulful purpose of this? Because there was, you know, they don't create budget planning to crush our souls. That wasn't the purpose. There's some purpose. The purpose like for budget planning, for example, is to allocate the resources in the best way to create the best way we can optimally to create a thriving company so we can all keep working there and be happy. But um, that's not what it's become for a lot of companies but we can take it back and go back to that soulful purpose. Um, and then the last question is simply, what would it take to bring in, to bring soul back into that process? Like if you had your magic, that's your magic wand question of if I had a magic wand, how can I make my budget planning process more soulful? So those are things I use to think about um, when I, um, look at organizational systems and not just, you know, you do process improvement and it's, you can fix the process, but you really do need to think about like, will it crush souls also? All right. Let me take a pause there for a second. Any questions on the organizational system or soulful organizations, I should say, or comments? All right. I'm going to keep going. It's getting late at night. Uh, so those are just examples of, that's just an example of how you can bring soulfulness into your organizational system. But let's talk about, um, well, there's a couple of things here. The Agilist's role in creating organizations or creating soulful organizations. But let's talk about, um, let's just talk about Agile and soul for a minute. I put this elephant in the room here. Um, so has Agile lost its soul? 
Like, have we lost the soul of agility? And I put, you know, I had done this talk. It was the soul of agility. So I put this in here for that. But I wonder, like, with our work, have we lost some of the soulfulness? It brings back to me the slide when you compare the language of flourish and thrive versus the language of ambitious, successful. I think that agile, at least the perception of agile by many people, has gone through this transformation from the part where it was all about flourishing and thriving into the part about being ambitious and successful and results oriented. Oh, yeah. Results oriented. Uh, I could add that to my list. Yeah, I, I think a couple things. Big, big A agile. Um, it it's not agile. It's it's implementing Scrum, enforcing a methodology on an organization. It's not it's not helping an organization find their way of working together and deliver uh, quickly and easily and and discover things as they go. It's mm -hmm. it's following a predefined process. And in yeah. saying that it's agile when it's really not. Dean, it looked like you were going to say something and then Daniel. Dean? Well, um, yeah, I, th I think, you know, part of it is, uh, I agree that, you know, part of it is, um, I guess, is it, is it true agile or is it true scrum or whatnot, right? So, um, so, well, maybe just in name only and uh, all those principles um, of uh, and you know foundations of agile maybe they already kind of was were washed washed away so that's one comment i wanted to make we kind of agree with what david said or part you know part of what david said uh, and second thing um um i mean the, the fact that you know training never stops that you know scrum you know scrum comes after scrum after you know comes after scrum that is you know in these um cadence right i think you know there is a risk of uh, there is a risk of kind of um you know being mechanical uh, not th th flourishing and so on and so forth yeah so there is there is there i guess in in in, in intrinsic risk of um you know that agile may 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 feel um i guess too i guess too harsh okay just the comments okay daniel i think a couple things um to dean and david's point there's sort of agile and what people do um i can remember with iso and i can remember with cmm and now we have it with agile that the ideas are good um and the implementation is often bad, um, but that doesn't mean the idea isn't good. Um, and right now, I think we've reached a state in the industry where companies that truly could be agile are agile. And the ones that are going through transformations are you know, laggards in terms of the technology adoption curve, and they're never gonna be agile. They're just not. And so, you know, these companies are trying to, like you mentioned before, right, buy agility from a consulting company and put it in place. And so the rest of us who are agilists look at that and go, well, you know, agility is losing its soul. It's like, no, it's not losing its soul. Those companies using your language, they have no soul. So they're never going to be agile. The yeah. ones that could be agile are agile. So I, I think there's a lot of things that are happening at the same time. And I think also in some cases, I think finally, big organizations, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people really struggle to function effectively. And um, sometimes what we think of as agile, whether it's Scrum or Kanban, doesn't really apply. Um, you need other techniques for more standard, run-of-the-mill, predictable activities. Yeah. Ashish, did you have a comment? Thank you, Daniel, by the way. Sorry. Ashish, I I muted you because you were had some background noise, but you can unmute. Is it okay now? Yeah. Okay, so I agree with what Dan is saying, right? Mm -hmm. It's one of the techniques, right? And the, one of the pertinent question is, we are agile. What, what, what we do we need to transform? So basically increasing the maturity, right, of your agility of your state of agility, matureness, right? And this, uh, you know, getting sore into agility 
is certainly one of the things that can be a very good leverage and that you know to 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 increase agility and so right so it's the essence and there is a lot that can be done using these techniques yeah well so with that i'm going to jump you to the question here and i do have a slido here although you know there's just a few of us but i, I like the slido uh so how can we, so now that we talked about maybe agile has not lost its soul but has some opportunities where can we bring more soulfulness in so i'm going to throw up the uh uh, the last slide out here and see if you have some thoughts. This is a harder question than my previous ones, but how we might bring some more soul into Agile. Talk about the difficult things with compassion. Yeah, that's what agilists are good at, right? I think there's a lot to being an agile coach or scrum master that um, has gotten started to be viewed as like process implementers, where we had all these other skills about being able to facilitate difficult conversations was, you know, that's a valuable skill. With compassion, of course. Don't be afraid to stay true to the concept, people over process. Yeah, right. People and interactions over processes and tools. But in a lot of places, it's not that anymore. Uh, bring soul to finance and HR, please. Those processes create the context for product and development teams. Yep. Give teams freedom to succeed. Great. Understand the context of the company and base your practice from there. Well, what if the context of the company is like, you know, to be a soulless uh, implementer? You can always leave the company. Well, if, yes, I just wanted to see if it was like you should base your practice on that. No, actually, that's something that, and I think this is a fun one that comes up, I think, based on a lot of your stories, Georgina. You don't always know the context of the company until you get there you know, or in the big sure. end or after a month or three months. So, you know, yeah, that could be a good thing. You know, it could be a catalyst for good change, but yeah, sometimes you might get bumped out. Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh, sorry, I'm missing these. Uh, show up with empathy towards those who are getting started in this journey. Everyone learns and adapts at different speeds and then focus on the problem rather than the blame. Good, yeah, all good answers. You know, one of the other times I gave this talk, maybe it was in North Carolina, there was a this there was some thinking that like some of the people who are newer to agile don't have the soulful background of agile that some of us who have been around longer have you know we were the true believers you know we have that we believe in bringing it really was to bring soul to software organizations at first and i think some of the new folks are kind of being trained in just process implementation uh build projects around okay yes this is one of the agile uh principles there thank you Give them the environment and the support they need and the trust to get the job done. All right, I see one more coming in and then we will keep on moving along. But this is the heart of it, right? This is the, what, how do we actually take these concepts and bring them in? You know, we can bring in language, you know, we can, because we are the people who bring that in, right? We've brought in so much language already. Let's see. I think, you know, there's, listen first, don't assume you know the answer. People are more capable than we give them credit for. Yeah, listening is a great skill agilists have. Um, I think being willing to just ask the question, is the, will this be soul crushing, is a lot of, you know, what we can do, sim simply just ask the question. Okay, thank you. This is all wonderful. Okay, now... Part of my book, one of the things I say in the book about transformational leaders, but I really do think agilists are transformational leaders by, na by nature, is that a transformational leader is part spiritual leader, part work manager, part inspirer, and part community builder, because we really do all these things. It's not just, you know, like work manager, is it? That's, you know, of course, that's part of it. But we really do, you know, I say spiritual leader, I don't mean religious, but that's what, as agilists, we are lifting spirits, we are holding the hope for people. 
So I think that agilists do all those things. Um, so I've always had clients that kind of like me who know me, even though on paper, I might look like other people, but they've worked with me and they're like, we like it because you care and you, you know, like all these words that ultimately mean I bring soulfulness with the consulting that I do. But it was sort of like they buy the business results and I give them a little side of soulfulness that they're not actually paying for <laughs> because that's just kind of how I do my job. But I sort of made a promise to myself that this year I was going to take my soulfulness from being implicit to being explicit and, you know, being more open about like, we need more, like this is soul crushing, not just kind of like, Hey, like maybe we can tweak it around the edges. So that's my promise to myself. And I would love for you to all join me in that. And taking so taking soulfulness like out of the shadows and being much more explicit about it. I think people are ready. I think people want it. Okay, just to review what we talked about: soulful leader, soulful team, soulful organization. Um, bringing soulful lens to your work. So remember, we talked about the three conditions: dignity, creativity, and connection. We talked about soulful language. And then we talked about leaders developing the self-awareness and not polluting, teams healing their pain, and then organizations using those three steps of what was supposed to, like, why is it soul crushing? What, what was original soulful purpose and how can we bring it back? So I'm just going to leave you, that's kind of a summary of what we talked about. And I just want to leave you with one story here and it's an agile story. So you'll like it. Um, I was working my first team that I coached and I wasn't even really a coach. I was an apprentice coach to Ahmed Sidki, if you guys know him. Um, so I, he was like the main coach and I was kind of watching and learning. But afterwards, uh, one day, or as the pro project was kind of dying down because it was not a longstanding team, sadly, I was in the elevator and uh, this guy got in with me, Frank, and he's holding this giant trophy that you see in the picture here. Not really, it's not really the trophy, but it's a, similar to that trophy. Because remember, we used to get those giant trophies. And he gets on the elevator and I said, Frank, nice job with all your success, like on, on the team. And he said, yeah, we had unprecedented success on this team. It was great. But then he pauses and he looks at me and he says, with tears in his eyes, he said something that I will never forget. He says, what's more important than the success and the trophy is that it changed my life. And he said, for 15 years, I came into this building. I sat in my cubicle quietly without even knowing the people that sat next to me. And now I come into work and I have people to eat lunch with. I know the people around me. I, I'm energized when I come in. And that is worth more than any award. And that was the moment I knew that Frank had found soul at work. And you can too. And so can your teams. So that's why I do this work <clears throat> because of Frank. So businesses thrive when they use a soulful lens. Here's a bunch of my stuff here. We can definitely stay connected. Please connect with me on LinkedIn, um, my website, Rosetta Agile. Um, I'm launching, I have a community of transformational leaders you can join, soon to have a training, um, all kinds of stuff for you. And I will, oh, I'll leave that slide up instead of putting the question slide, but questions or comments? Uh, thank you so much, Jardin. It was such a pleasure uh, listening to this conversation. Um, <laughs> I have a thought about the slide about uh, being spiritual leaders and inspirers. Yeah, let's go to it for a second. So I'm pretty sure even now we have in agile community, even here in Princeton, once in a while, we have people who are so obsessed with agile that they create documents and methodologies and documents on top of documents about everything agile. So if they saw this slide, they would probably uh, create a whole document, how to be a spiritual leader and an inspirer. Uh, isn't that funny? Yes. So everything can be understood uh, in a very bureaucratic way, but uh, there are things that are uh, just a matter of uh, the right spirit, right? Well, it's funny that you say that because there is this tendency to try and like codify everything. Yep. And I remember I worked at Verizon and they didn't want to bring in my expensive facilitator trainer because um, they were like, we have facilitation training. So they showed, they like, here's the deck. Here's the deck we used. What do you think? And I looked through it 
and the words were all there like it wasn't wrong but it sucked the life out of facilitation in that deck <laughs> you know it turned it into the dullest thing i ever saw right so, mm -hmm. So even in terms of uh, language, we just did this exercise in language. How can we replace this ling this word that already sounds bureaucratic and formal with something new and fresh? But I'm sure this word that today sounds formal, there was a period in time when it was something innovative and creative. So even the words that we came up with today, like flourish and thrive, after a while, someone will take it and will create bureaucratic documents on top of that word and that language. And we will have, as creative people, we will have to come up with yet new language, right? <laughs> well, maybe, or maybe they'll change it, right? That's the other fear. But um, yeah, well, we have to keep pushing. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Oh, where's who was saying it before? Oh, it was you, David. It is thundering now and raining. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It passed through here. Okay. Well, I, I guess I guess the question I have is, okay. I, I I think all, so much of this is really the way we should be working, and people should be thinking more about this. And how do we, uh, for the lack of a better word, spread the gospel and and you know get others on board? Because I you know I just heard a story today where a friend of mine um, was laid off from her job after. 20 years with this company because they merged with another company and no kind of idea that that was going to happen. And it's just, you know, it's just, why this isn't the way the working world should be, right? And it's mm -hmm. just, it's gone, it is, there's too many, too much soul sucking and not yeah. enough soul, yeah. Soul filling. So, I mean, look, we, don't, we can only deal with the part of the world that we yeah, have the severe of influence, right? Yeah, but we have agilists are some of the people in the room where it happens, like Hamilton would say, right? So like a lot of times we are in the room where it happens. So we need to be asking the question, like, can we do this in a less soul crushing way? Can we do this? Because maybe, look, sometimes layoffs are inevitable, but they right. don't have to be soul crushing. Right. You know, right. they can be handled with dignity. They're not always handled with dignity. <laughs> so yeah. if you're in those rooms... You know, or you're coaching those leaders or, you know, I talk to org design people too, right? Because you're creating some of those processes. You need to be asking if it, how we can do it so it's not soul crushing. Yeah. All right. Other questions or comments? I'm thinking, uh, let's say we meet with us in the same group five years from now. What would we uh, be talking about and how the things will change? Probably some of the notions here that are innovative as of right now, five years from now, will already become common, common thing for uh, agile organizations. And we will have to, again, reinvent and reinvent. Reinvention is an, uh, a continuous uh, process i guess here right well if that's the case though natalie then how wonderful is that though right that mm -hmm. be being soulful is commonplace so yeah we have to re reinvent to have a new job but the world would be lovely <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. right? i mean i hope that being soulful is commonplace and i think um some of the younger folks too will be pushing this because they don't really want to put up with some of this soullessness Definitely. Uh, we did an article on uh, Gen Z take on a uh, job market. And a lot of that was revolving around purpose driven jobs. They want mm. purpose. Maybe mm. when they grow older, they are not interested in purpose anymore. But it's not a good thing, right? Losing the uh, strive for purpose. It's good. Oh, it's normal to strive for purpose. Yeah, in your careers. Mm -hmm. I think the, this next generation is more than we were. I mean, listen, I grew up in the 80s. Purpose was not even on the radar. We just didn't want, want to make money. <laughs> right? That's all mm. we cared about. Or sorry, I shouldn't speak for mm. all of us. That's all I cared about. <laughs> it was different in my country. It was different. I didn't, I, I'm not saying it was better. Definitely it was not, <laughs> but it was different. Yeah. 
Where are you from, Natalie? I grew up in the Soviet Union. My childhood uh, was in the Soviet Union in Latvia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was not about money, but it was worse than that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing from all of you about how you've taken this forward, and I will hear from you because I've given this talk, and I end up hearing from everybody. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to seeing how you've kind of introduce some of this into your world. Sounds good. Thank you, Jardina. You're so welcome. It was nice to spend time Great. with this group. Thank you, Jardina. Mm -hmm.